Well, Helena, Miss Havisham is one of Dickens' most memorable females, and she's often been portrayed as much older, as a bit of a crone on, on various television and film adaptations. But your take on her is very refreshing, I feel. She's in kind of late youth or very early middle age in this. That's very sweet of you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep, very early. Uh, yeah. So what was the thinking behind this, this fresh look at her? I mean, how did you see her and want to portray her? Well, when first Matt approached me, I did think, oh, God, has he, has, you know, have I missed something? I'm, you know, I'm not that old. <laughs> and they said, no, 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 she's not as old as you think. If you do the maths, if you look at the book, she's actually, when she gets jilted, she's about 27. Then, then the action, when we meet her, but when Pitt meets, she's probably about 45 and then to 54. So you're exactly the right age to play Miss Havisham. He kept on saying that throughout, which was kind of like, okay, don't need to hear it every day. But, um, um... But then, so then I looked and I thought, oh wow, what an original idea! This is good. And it's always one of the things that makes one want to do a part is like, oh, that's an already an original take. Until I just realised that then Gillian Anderson was doing it, who's even younger than me. So I thought this is not such an original take. But never mind, you know. So, but by then I'd already said yes. So, um, and then I read the book, which I don't, I hadn't actually read. Well, not that I remember much these days. But I don't think I'd read. And there's so many colours, and it is so it's such a complex part. And she's completely barking. I mean, not everybody is jilted, closes all the doors, carries on to wear their wedding dress for the rest of their lives, and um, shuts themselves out. You know, shuts all the sunlight out, and and it's a pretty extreme reaction. And I gather um, you did a bit of research into to you know what a human would look like after 15 years deprivation of fresh air and, and sunlight. sunlight as well. What? what yeah. Well, about? I did. I mean, there was the obvious thing. I love all that. I love like diagnosing a part, and it's a bit like Sherlock Holmes come dash with um, my mom's psychotherapist. So I guess I've sort of inherited that. So I thought, well, if you are, you know, me and Mike went down the osteoporosis route for quite far actually, um, which is such a hideous disease. But it was pr pretty much almost certain that she would have had it if you'd not been outdoors for about 15, 20 years, not that age. But then, you know, practically speaking, I suddenly realised as I was sort of doing osteoporosis, you know, posture, this will go immediately. That's one of the first bones. So then I just spend the whole part like this. So they'd have to put the camera down like this. So it was just like, well, that's not practical. So I did things like, when I read it, he, it's pretty much in the... So I, I just went stiff joints. I thought, if you're sitting down for most of the time, these, I, my, my chiropractor actually, Dominic, helped me. These, these would be quite short. I mean, I went to town on ideas. I remember writing a thing to Mike, and you know, I think he's, I love having all the ideas, and I think he just wanted to cherry pick. I think, well, he said cherry pick, meaning like some were good and some were crap. And um, I wanted to have a whole bird's nest, a real bird fly out of my, um, my hair at one point. Then I had a contact lens, which because I thought, well, she can't really see, and it, she's always saying, come nearer, come nearer. So I think there was a milk, we had contact lenses. I had full on, it was a real dress up time. I had the veil, I thought the veil, there's a lot of fairy tale imagery, he describes her. So there's Rapunzel in there with her long veil, and I felt like as long as the years go by, the veil grows longer. And she's got all these stars in her, in her all the jewels were stars, which I thought could twinkle a bit. That's all her money, and she's got a Stella. And, and then I used the lorgnette sort of as a fairy godmother. She's often seen as a fairy godmother and sort of self-appoints herself as fairy godmother to Pip. And, um, and then Cinderella too, because <clears throat> in the book it says that she was only putting her shoes on when she heard the news, so she only got one shoe on and one shoe off. So I played the whole part with one shoe on and one shoe off. I'm not sure if that registers. Anyway, I definitely had fun um, trying to uh, deconstruct her. And you're really well known for your own fashion flair, and I wondered, you know, looking at her, there's something of the kind of distressed Vivian, Wed Wed Vivian Westwood. Westwood look Westwood. to yeah. her. <laughs> Westwood look to her yeah. to her dress. Did you have any sort of input oh, to I had a lot the to say. dress and, and also the hair? You know, the big hair. That yeah, yeah. No, of course. Of Jenny Shackle, who is brilliant, mm. and Mike said, "Look, obviously we can't do big hair again." I said, "What do you mean big hair? When have I done big hair?" You know, and. Um, I said, no, 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 And so we went for sort of, at first they thought like balls and everything, but it ended up being big because you have to sort of work from the inside and out. And if she, you have, it starts off quite short when she's 27, but then by the time she just grows, everything grows. I mean, she's just in this state of overgrownness and decay, you know, because nothing, there's no life to it, but the hair grows. So it ended up being quite a lot of it. I mean, looking back on it, I thought maybe less because it should have fallen out. I mean, you always think of, but um, yeah, a lot of hair. Um, but again, I, I, next part I'm going to have less hair, no hair. Given you know, 
I just like it because if you've got curly hair, no one can touch you up because it doesn't matter. It looks a mess. They're not going to go, oh, that curl's in the wrong place. And so they leave you alone. Um, what, there was something else I was going to say. And about you, well, it's just about the hair. Your, your input to book. To oh, yeah, no, those. Beatrice was amazing, the costume person. And so we had these wings that were broken, um, the sort of angel look going on and all her... Um, I mean, the dress, we had three dresses of different states of decay as the years went on. There was sort of bird-like, sort of, because everything's desiccated and so dry. And that's partially why she goes up in flames so quickly um, at the end. Um, and uh, there's so much detail that you don't, I don't think you necessarily see. We, don't, we had actual lots of animals in my veil, um, but they didn't necessarily read. Um, but um, also, you know, like maggots and spiders mm -hmm. and because of the decomposition and just... But she in herself, I, I, one idea that I had, I don't know if it comes across, is that she's always just about... She, great expectations when I read it, and you always, always have basically, it's, it, you know, such an ego. A complete egoist as an actor. You think, no, it's all about great expectations. I mean, she has great expectations. She's still expecting him to come through the door, the one who jilted her. So she's always putting on her makeup obsessively getting ready for the moment when, oh yeah, it was a bit of a misunderstanding. So there's a sort of wild hope to her too. Um, and the one real moment of tenderness, which is when she brings the very young Estella in under that veil, and the two of the, you and the child are backlit as well, that is a magic, it's a charged moment. I mean, what did you feel about uh, the, the, the DP on the, on the film? It, it's painterly looking at times. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 you never see what you look like, obviously. I, mean, I never mm -hmm. look but all that, but, um, but it was fantastic to act in. It was kind of nice to be in the dark, to be honest, <laughs> most of the time. I always loved the dark. <laughs> And it's, that's why we like the cinema. So it was kind of nice for there not to be too many lights. I and mean, I really couldn't see much because I had lenses. I was a liability, actually, between the lenses and the dress and the veil. And every time I swung my head, the veil would go. And then just I, by the time I got to the trailer, I'd have everything on the veil, like half the tea, you know, sandwiches. I mean, it, just, it was a mess. And Helen, what for you are the particular pleasures of A Mouthful of Dickens as filtered through David Nichols and his script writing? What, a mouthful? A mouthful of Dickens, yes, <laughs> as filtered through David what, what's Nichols. What's it like to speak? Yeah, yeah, what's it like to speak? I yeah. think what David did, which was great, because a lot of it is, you know, there are a lot of words in that book, and he really filleted it beautifully. Um, so, but it didn't seem too um, theatrical or... But then possibly because Dickens himself was an actor too, so he had a good... You know, he obviously had a good ear for dialogue. Um, but uh, David Nichols too... You know, he saw so much more potential in, in Miss Havisham that had already been, you know, not necessarily portrayed up to then. I think there was a sort of, con we talked about it, or well, at least I talked about it with Mike, and it was all there in the text. So, yeah, you've not got, you don't feel tempted to rewrite it. You always got tempted to, of course, say, oh, there's this bit in the book, can I just, you know, make my part bigger? Um, but as ever, less is more. And is Dickens an author that you, you read a lot growing up? Is he somebody that you do return to? Is he kind of on your radar? For I love Dickens, yeah. and a lot of the time I think I'm not necessarily thinking of the actual stories, although I did love Great Expectations when I came to read it for this part. And I loved his humanity and the characters, his humanity, like Wemmick, I love. He's, he's such a wonderful man, such a wonderful character, and the fact that there's two Wemmicks, there's one at work and then there's one at home, and his whole aged P bit and that whole... I love that, and um, and even and Magwitch too, and there is great forgiveness of people, um, and humour, and it is really really funny. Um, but I also what I liked about Mike's sort of take on it was that he makes it quite theatrical. It's still got a theatre because there's always a massive energy Dickens has, and that's what I love, his energy that he gives, and it's his and his language fizzes it. And Mike's got that as a character. He might have you know he's a big, he's bold, he's got a bombast there's something I don't know he's big and bold and loud and you know he everything's big he eats you know a lot Mike which I love you can barely hear action and cut because he's still chomping or something you know. <laughs> and uh, he's just hilarious so it's almost like I just thought well you're the right person to direct it because you're somehow you know you've got Dickens and you're channeling him his spirit I just want to round up by saying, you know, talking to young people today, I find that so few of them have read Dickens or been encouraged to read Dickens. Mm. And here we are, you know, watching this fantastic film. What would you say to, you know, young cinema goers to, to, to encourage them to go along to see works like this? Um, 
Well, it's a wonderful story. I mean, this is one. There's a reason why stories get retold, you know, because um, they're just great. That's why um, great. You know, that's why it's been retold and retold and retold. Um, and this is pretty modern and accessible, and you know, it's a great story. It's a classic. Been wish every success when it's released here in the world. Helena, so. thank you very much and good to see you once again. Thank you. Thank you.